One of the main concerns you're going to have when you're trying to create realistic materials is the ability to judge how those materials are going to react in different situations under different lighting conditions or on different types of meshes with different shapes or different thicknesses. And this is an area where the typical shadable scene falls short because it's usually just a very controlled environment, a couple of area lights, and it really doesn't show you how your shaders are going to react under a variety of different conditions. And as I'm in the process of creating an advanced shading course for Modo, this shortcoming became really apparent to me because the normal shadable scene wasn't giving me the full picture of how my materials would react once I actually use them in production. And it quickly becomes very tedious having to open the shadable scene, make tweaks to your materials, and then import the material into a real production scene only to find that you're not really happy with how it's reacting in a different environment. So what I've done is I've created a much more versatile shadable scene. It's one that comes with 12 different environments that cover a wide range of different lighting conditions. And there's also seven different mesh types that you can test the materials on. So once again, it just gives you a much better idea of how your materials are going to react in different lighting conditions and on different kinds of meshes. So let me talk you through how you work with this scene. The first thing you should know is that generally the best workflow is to set your viewport to look through what's called the GL camera. There's two cameras that ship with the scene. There's a GL camera and a render camera. The render camera has the ability to zoom in and out onto the shader ball with this zoom control. However, that means that these locators that are at the bottom of the viewport also zoom in and out of view. It just makes it a bit more fiddly to work with them. Whereas the GL camera always stays static even when the render camera is zoomed in. So by looking through the GL camera, you always have access to these locators which allow you to uh, control how the shader ball scene is set up. Now, of course, you can also just look through the normal perspective viewport, but one drawback of doing that is that if you decide to scale the scene, the uh, objects are going to scale up and down in the viewport, which uh, just means you have to hunt around for the controls once again. Whereas if you're looking through the GL camera and you scale the scene, the camera is going to scale along with it. So you can see that everything stays in place, which just means it's a much nicer, more convenient workflow. So let's have a closer look at the controls. I'm going to start with this yellow locator on the left hand side, which is just general controls for the scene. Now make sure that uh, when you click on the locator and it brings up the channel hall tool, make sure that uh, you don't have anything cut off at the bottom. So just make sure it's dragged nicely into the viewport. And you can see the first control you have is that you can simply change the item type. And this is going to cycle through seven different types of meshes um, just to test out different shapes and they have different purposes for different kinds of materials and I'll demonstrate what these look like in preview in a minute. The other thing that you can control is the scene scale so you can have uh, your shader ball with a uh, overall uh, height of one centimeter or ten centimeters or one meter or ten meters and all your materials that are applied in world space are going to scale uh, accurately along with that. And I'll demonstrate that a bit later. You also have optional depth of field and the depth of field also reacts realistically with the scale. So for example, when your shader ball is set at the smallest setting, you'll see that the depth of field is very shallow. Whereas when you have your shader ball at the largest dimensions, the depth of field is very deep. However, if you find the depth of field distracting, you can simply um, disable it here. And finally, you have a render quality slider, which uh, has three settings. On the far left, you have one which is basically a very fast draft mode. And this is the mode that I recommend you use when you're doing tweaks. And then you have a medium setting and a high setting. And uh, my advice is basically just always leave it on one until you actually want to do a render of your shader ball and then you can set it up to the medium or high quality settings. And generally when I'm working with this shader ball, I tend to do all my renders in preview using extended refinement rather than using the F9 render.
So I'm going to unpause preview so that we can uh, have a look at all the different item types. So the first item type is basically just a standard shader ball but with some ridges on the side. And I find the ridges are useful for judging things like uh, SSS in particular. Now the second item type is just a standard shader ball with no ridges, just a more traditional shape. The third type is uh, more of a cube type shape because sometimes you just need some flat surfaces to be able to uh, see how your shading is going to react on those, especially if you're doing things like buildings or walls, anything that obviously has a lot of straight edges. The fourth item type is a wedge. And once again, this is really good for subsurface scattering, but it's also pretty useful for judging reflective uh, surfaces. And then we have a chess piece. So uh, this was modeled by Chris Haig. I got it from the share site. And once again, it's just a, it's just a more useful shape for certain types of shading, especially reflections and subsurface scattering. Next, I have a cloth with um, a ball behind it, or it's resting on a ball. So this is really useful for judging subsurface scattering and obviously for any kind of fabric type of shading. And finally, I have a uh, gem shape in case you need to uh, use transparency. Um, for transparency, I would either use this or maybe the uh, wedge shape, which is at position number four. So let me just quickly return to the standard shader ball and now we'll have a look at the other controls. So to demonstrate how the scaling works, I've created this brick texture and uh, you can see it's being projected as a solid with dimensions of 400 millimeters in all three axes. So if I activate my controls and I change the, sc the scene scale down to one centimeter, you can see that uh, the dimensions of the texture are affected. It uh, preserves the correct dimensions in relation to the ball. And the depth of field gets much shallower, just as it would if you were um, zooming down on a, on a very small object like this one. You can also see the texture on the floor reacts to the scene scale. So let's uh, scale back up. And now if we go up to one meter, pardon me, you can see that once again, the dimensions of the textures are preserved. The dimensions of the texture on the floor are also preserved. Now, the floor doesn't scale in a linear fashion because by the time you get to 10 meters, you wouldn't actually be able to see it if I did that. So it doesn't scale realistically on the floor, but it does scale realistically on the shader ball. You can see that the depth of field also gets much deeper as the scale gets larger. So finally, we have 10 meters and at this point, uh, the texture, the brick texture on the shader ball is absolutely tiny. And uh, the texture on the floor is also much smaller. Uh, so let me just uh, go back to 10 centimeters. Next, we'll have a look at the zoom control. So I'll just activate a bump map on my material. And if you click on this middle locator, you'll see that you've got an interactive zoom control for the render camera. The GL camera, as I said earlier, stays static, but your render camera can zoom in all the way from a 50 millimeter lens to the equivalent of a 300 millimeter lens. And this gives you a really close up view of your shading. Now, just bear in mind that if your scene scale is set at the smaller setting and you're zoomed in all the way to 300 millimeters, then obviously uh, your depth of field is going to get very shallow. However, if you find the depth of field distracting, you can simply disable it. Um, but personally, I actually find that having the depth of field is a really good visual clue for the scale of the scene. So um, that's why I've actually included it in the uh, shadable scene. So before moving on, I'm going to make another kind of demonstration. What I'm going to do is I'm going to activate this uh, subsurface scattering material. And uh, why this is really useful is that it's going to show you how the scene scale and the uh, mesh shape really affects what you see in your preview. And this is why you need this kind of versatile preview scene, because a, a typical shader ball isn't really going to cover you for a number of situations, especially where you've got uh, subsurface scattering. So you can see how the uh, shading reacts on this particular mesh item. But let me switch it to the uh, wedge shape. And you can see here, we've got a much clearer idea. Now, if I go to the actual SSS material itself, and I start playing with the maximum depth, 
you'll see that the wedge shape really reacts. You can see that all the darkening in the middle has disappeared. Now, if I undo that, just keep your eye on this middle part of the wedge shape. You'll see that um, as I undo, the darkening, which is controlled by this maximum depth setting, really shows up in this shape. Now, if I switch to the um, chess piece, you'll see that this is even clearer. Let's um, just drop the uh, controls and let this clear up for a second. And I'm just going to pause it right there. And I'm going to switch to a second preview window. And let's go back to our subsurface scattering. Now, if I increase the maximum depth to 50, have a look at the chess piece. So you can see that this mesh is much more useful as a gauge of how your subsurface scattering is going to react in a real world scene than a simple shader ball. Because if I go back to the uh, shader ball, let's do that right now. Pardon me. Switch back to my 3D view. Let's go back to the shader ball, even the one with ridges. So let's uh, leave that to clear up for a second. Because the ridges are quite useful and the base. These things give us a little idea of how the subsurface scattering is uh, reacting on our um, on our item. But if I pause that and go to preview here and then I reduce that down to 15 millimeters again. Just wait for this to update Oh, let's unpause it. You can see there is a slight difference. There's some darkening here. There's some darkening on the base, but on the wedge shape or the chest piece, these differences were just much more obviously apparent. So it's a much better guide for shading than just a simple ball, in my opinion, anyway. And as I mentioned earlier, the scene scale is also going to have a big effect on this. So let's change back to the chest piece once again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the maximum depth a little bit more. So let's reduce it to, say, five millimeters. And you can see as I do this, the chest piece really darkens. But let's change the scene scale. So let's go down to one. And now you can see that it brightens up again because obviously the uh, subsurface scattering is traveling longer before it's being blocked. But if I go up the other way, you can see it darkens considerably and that only at the edges are we still seeing the subsurface scattering. So once again, having these kinds of shapes is really useful because it just gives us a much better idea of how materials are going to react. Next, we'll have a look at the environment controls. So I'm just going to quickly switch to my standard shader ball and I'm going to activate this uh, gold material. And uh, if you click on the blue locator on the right hand side, that will bring up the environment controls. At the bottom, you'll find a rotate view slider, and this will basically rotate the lighting uh, all the way across your sphere. So it's useful for judging lighting coming from different directions and just seeing how your shaders react. And then you can also control the brightness of the environment. You can dim it or make it considerably brighter. Let's return it to one. Uh, you've got an area lights control, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, then you've got your environment select slider, and this will let you select any one of the 12 environments. So let's switch to environment number one, and you can see this is just a standard shadable scene. Now, if I switch to the perspective view, you can see that uh, in this particular case, I'm illuminating the shadable with luminous polygons. Um, but if you'd rather use aerial lights, simply bring up the environment controls and just tick aerial lights here and that will swap them out for aerial lights. The reason that I default to luminous polygons is that luminous polygons render much faster, but aerial lights are going to give you more accurate shadows. So it just basically depends on your needs. So let's now switch to environment number two. And this is basically just a darker variant of environment number one, a more low key uh, variant rather than the high key version that we have in environment number one. Now environment number three is a special case and this is very strong backlighting. It doesn't particularly work for this gold material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, activate some noise and disable the gold material. And uh, if we just wait patiently for preview to clear up, you'll see that in this case, having the really strong backlighting is very useful for revealing the uh, texture 
on the actual surface of the shader. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pause the video to let uh, preview clear up. And now that preview has cleared up, you can see that with this strong backlighting, we get a really good impression of the surface texture of the shaders. So if you're using bump maps or glossiness maps, it's a really nice way to check them out. Also note that the uh, material is applied to the floor in this particular environment. It's the only case where this happens, but again, with this strong backlighting, it's just really useful to see it. A final note is that in this uh, particular environment, the only option you have is area lights. You can't use luminous polygons because uh, they simply wouldn't be accurate enough, but that's also why it takes a little bit longer to render. So now we can switch to the next environment and this one, let me just reactivate my gold material so you can see the environment more clearly. This one is a physical sun and sky in Modo, and this is the only one where you'll see an actual specular highlight as opposed to a reflection because uh, Modo's physical sun always uh, shows up as a specular. Now the first four environments use lights, uh, the next eight all use different HDR environments. So the next one is the one I was using at the start of the video. Now most of these HDRs come from this site, hdri-hub.com, and they're redistributed under a Creative Commons attribution license, and I'm very grateful to these guys for making their HDRs available in this way. So now I'll just uh, cycle through the uh, remaining environments, and you can see that uh, it's a bunch of different uh, spherical HDRs that will just give you a really good idea of how your shading is going to react in uh, widely different lighting conditions. You can see that every time I move the slider we get a very very different result and this really helps to avoid nasty surprises. Um, you can see that the shading is going to hold up under a whole range of different lighting conditions and this is going to help you create much better shaders and uh, end up doing far less retakes. So you can see that this shadable scene has a lot of functionality which is going to be really useful to anyone shading in Modo. I'd also add to anyone who's interested in advanced shading in Modo to look out for my forthcoming Shading Masterclass course which will be on my Vimeo channel which is at vimeo.com forward slash Richard Yacht where I'll be producing a multi-part advanced shading course.